Welcome back to this little series I'm doing, just showing you my tables of contents from my various different books so that you can see if there's something of interest that you might want to learn more about. Number two, after the end times timeline of journey through the end of days, is like, okay, well, if we can find out the final Jubilee year, what does the Bible tell us? Perhaps the time of year. So that was the logic that I went into this with. And actually, since part three of the final book had been discussing the fact that all of the feasts have already found fulfillment in the person of Christ out of necessity because he fulfilled all the law, all jack and tittles before he declared it finished, bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So let's talk about that again in more depth. And then let's, since we can essentially throw out the necessity of a fall second coming what the Bible actually say about it. So here's a table of contents in my second book. Chapter one, distinguishing legal from prophetic. Where are you getting your information from as far as your study of the end times? Are you getting it from the books of prophecy or are you getting it from the books of law? Because all of the legal things relating to Christ are in all jets and all titles fulfilled by the time he declared it finished. So if you're taking your idea of what's going to happen in the future strictly from the books of law, then you're doing it wrong. You have to look at the prophecies. That's why we have the books of the major prophets and the minor prophets. So that's where we need to look for our prophecy about the end times. Because if we're taking it from the law, we're taking it from something that was already declared finished. Now that doesn't mean that the books of law themselves do not contain prophecies relating to the second coming. They surely do. But the law itself, especially in Leviticus, is done. So if we're taking our prophecy from Leviticus, we're not doing it right. Chapter 2, the legal implications of redemption. Why did Jesus do what he do, did? Well, because Jesus was born under the law to redeem people from the curse of the law. That's why he had to declare it, or that's why he had to fulfill it in all jots and all titles in all parts. He had to finish the works of the law, which he did. People say, well, I need to keep the feast because Jesus did. Well, Jesus did it because he was required to by the law, and if he hadn't, he would have been breaking the law, and therefore would not have been sinless and perfect. He was required by the law to do what he did, and so that he could overcome the curse of sin and death, which is associated to imperfect mankind keeping the law. That's the whole reason Jesus did what he did, so that he was perfect and sinless, which is why you don't have to, because he did it so you don't have to. Legal implications of redemption. So from start to finish, how were all of them, how did all of them find fulfillment in the person of Christ? Not even fulfillment uh, in individual parts. They all pointed to Christ. So how did them pointing to Christ accomplish what these foreshadow. We begin with the Feast of Tabernacles. That was his birth. Day of Atonement. He assumed the role of the scapegoat. Day one of his ministry, his baptism. Feast of Trumpets. This was what he did during, throughout the whole of his ministry. He was the literal voice of God on earth. That is what the trumpet is, synonymous with the voice of God. Why on Tishri 1? Because the assumed date of creation, the incarnation of Jesus, the word who became flesh and dwelt among us, is also the one who spoke creation into existence. Day 1, Tishri 1. Therefore, you have the incarnation of the creator, who is also the savior and the redeemer, ministering, sounding the trumpet, three and a half years long. Um, Feast of Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits, Feast of Weeks. We know all of those. So this goes in depth about how each single one of them was forward looking to the body of Christ and what Christ would accomplish, what he did accomplish. Prior to um, leaving the earth, essentially, or prophecies that he would give because the Feast of the Weeks found fulfillment with the sending of the Spirit, which Jesus prophesied about in John 14. So he foreshadowed that it would come and it did happen later. So these all found fulfillment in and through the person of Christ. Not just in what he did, but literally who he was. Clearing up more misunderstandings. Um, and this comes Matthew 24, 36, where people say, No man knoweth day or the hour. Well, the Bible doesn't actually say that, so what does it say? And more importantly, what do those words actually mean? Acts 1, I believe it's 7, where people say, 
when his disciples asked him when he was going to return and set up the kingdom, he said, these things are not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. He wasn't brushing them off. He wasn't blowing them off. He wasn't refusing to answer them. What he was saying, that word know, it is not for you to know, means to experience firsthand. What was Jesus telling his disciples? That the coming of the kingdom, his second coming, was not going to happen in their natural lifetime. Okay, well, that actually is quite helpful, that information. They don't need to know specifically because it's not going to happen while they're alive. So live your life, do your stuff, and don't worry about it. Times and seasons of the kingdom, times and seasons of the day of the Lord. Um, I also go through 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 3 specifically. Uh, and then I talk about, obviously, Matthew 24, 13, because that is a huge stumbling block to a lot of people who say, we can't know, so we shouldn't try to know. What does that actually mean? What is that actually talking about? Because it's not what most people say it is. Chapter 14, seated at the right hand of the Father. Chapter 15, the judgment of the summer fruit. Why do I spend so much time in the Old Testament? Because look, this is where the prophecies all come from. The book title also, Amos, book of Amos, book of Hosea. Uh, in contrast to the grape harvest, this is different. The harvest of the grapes is the unbelieving Gentiles, which is specifically way different from the judgment of the summer fruit, which will be result in a believing Israel. Parable of the fig tree, curse of the fig tree, deliverance for Israel. The reckoning of the new years for kings. How do we know when all this is going to happen? Well, because the Bible tells us when these things happened in the past, so we know when they'll happen in the future. Guideposts of the 70 weeks. I don't know where the word weeks went, but guideposts of the 70 weeks. The marriage supper of the Lamb, how's that going to fit in at the end of days? So that followed on the heels of the final Jubilee year. It's like, okay, so if we can know when the final year will be, not necessarily what it's associated to at that point in time, but, but can we narrow down a time of year? Certainly can. So that's that book. That was number two. Book number three, since I have some time, I will proceed into the next one. Book number three was a topical study because people were saying Psalm 83 or Isaiah 17 is going to uh, be something that happens in the lead up to the rapture. Like we're going to see these things while we're still here because Damascus is becoming a ruinous heap. So I said, okay, is that what these actually mean? What does the Bible tell us? So this is just a real short topical study, and I go word by word through both of these chapters. The timing of Psalm 83 and Isaiah 17. So I introduce Psalm 83, and I go through verses 1 through 5. And then I go through chapters 6 through 8. What do I do in the process of doing this? Tell you, all of these people groups who are listed, who is Amalek? Who are the Ishmaelites and the Hagarites? Who, are, who is Moab and Ammon? Who are the Philistines? Who is Asher, the Assyrians? Where do all these people come from? Who are they? And why do they have vendettas against God that they use to try to get uh, at Israel to get to God? So I go through who are all of these people. Psalm 83, 9 through 12. And then um, let's see. There's more to this. So what should I bring up a PDF so I can Make sure I'm telling you guys everything. Oh, okay, I did. Um, so then, all of these people, oh, the Philistine, the God of the Tyre, so then I conclude it. Actually, we'll just go back here. Um, so I basically go through sections of these verses and just explain them word by word. The Tabernacles of Edom. Ammon, the Philistines, the Gaza, Tyre, all of that. Where are these scriptures located? These sister verses, where are these other places that we can go to scripture to validate what Psalm 83 is telling us and when it's going to happen? So then I conclude it. Do the same thing with the burden of Damascus. Basically, make it, uh, basically break it down into sections and discuss each of these sections and how they correlate to other prophecies in the Old Testament specifically and when these things are going to happen. Um, back here in Psalm 83, it's, it's uh, the psalmist um, who wrote these. 
Why am I drawing a blank? Um, A. Starts with an A. <laughs> I totally can't think of an A at this time. Um, but the psalmist who's writing these, he's saying, do unto these people as you did unto. Do unto these people as you did unto. So you go back to the book of Judges and find where those stories came from and how God did what he did and link that also to the, the prophecies in the Old Testament of when God's going to act in a similar way as regards Israel or through Israel. So that is that book. Um, next up, number four was because I started on this path of, okay, well, Psalm 83 and Isaiah 17 is not actually tied to the rapture. It's not going to happen. By the rapture, these are culminations or summations that are going to occur with a specific event. They're tied to the second coming. And that's very clear when you actually start delving into it. So from that, I was like, okay, well, I don't want to like burst everybody's bubble. I don't want to like be all this, you know, negative Nancy raining on everybody's parade about the rapture and signs and all this stuff. So let's write a book about the rapture. Let's, yeah, let's tell everybody, yep, it's right. And this is why. But just because it's right doesn't mean all of this other stuff is contextually accurate when you try to place it at or near or before the rapture because it's not. So just because I'm saying all this other stuff that we're trying to link to the rapture isn't right doesn't mean the rapture is still not pre-trib. It is. We just need to be careful of what we're trying to, to link to it that's wrong. And so book four, which I'll go through next, start with next in the next video, is uh, the table of contents for truth in defense of the pre-trib rapture. Hope to see you guys in the next video.